how did you learn to paint? You can paint Space Marine Army after Space Marine Army and you won't get any better as a painter. It doesn't take 10,000 hours of practice. It takes 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. The thing that's the trick of it is knowing what corners to cut. Yeah, I think that's been so critical for my journey. If you're a long-term listener of the podcast, you'll know how important it is to have the right tools to aid you in your painting. And if there's one piece of equipment that I could never live without, it's my Onyx lamp from Native Lighting. It doesn't matter what brush or paints you have if you can't see what you're doing in the first place. The Onyx is the perfect lamp for miniature painting because it's super bright, 2,200 lumen LEDs cast soft and diffused light on your models without any harsh shadows. And its daylight balanced color temperature of 6,500K gives you the confidence that the colors you are painting are accurate. As someone with a very small hobby desk, by far my favorite feature though is its articulating arm, which clamps to the side of your desk, maximizing your workspace. It's also super adjustable so you can sit comfortably in the perfect painting position without sacrifice. It also folds up into a compact shape, which is great if you like to travel to paint with your friends. To upgrade your setup and order yours now, head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop or head to the link in this episode's description. Hello everyone, and welcome to Paint Perspective, episode 63. James, we're teeing up another guest. We are, definitely. I needed some social media advice, and there's only one person better to ask than Quipster. <laughs> welcome <laughs> to the show. <laughs> wow, that was amazing. <laughs> Could have timed that better. That was great. That was better. Okay, well, for anyone who doesn't know, God forbid, who is Quipster? Oh God, okay. Um, hello everyone. Uh, do, do, I, do I speak to camera? I you don't even know. Speak to whoever you speak want. To whoever you want. Okay. To I think it might be a bit intense if you speak to camera the entire time. <laughs> hello everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I am Quipster. Um, actually, a lot of people ask me where that name comes from. Yeah, let's start with that. I yeah. Think, yeah. So I've actually made content before, uh, non-Warhammer stuff. I, I started on YouTube because I watched a lot of, um, do you know Casey Neistat? I don't, yeah, yeah. but George uh, probably does. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. he was a big YouTuber. He actually invented the genre of vlogging. Yep. Uh, and so he was making a lot of stuff back in 2015, 16. And I was like, you know, I could, I could do that. So I didn't want to use my real name because, you know, I had That's a fair. job at the time. And so I was like, okay, I need to pick a name. And I know that Childish Gambino picked Childish Gambino from a hip hop name generator. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, I could do that. So I went on a hip hop name generator, clicked the button a couple of times, and it came up with some like radiophonic quipster. I was like, aha, quipster. That's unique. That's really interesting. I, I never would. I literally yeah. thought it was something that you just randomly thought of or whatever. Oh. Like going into a random I always assume generator. when someone has a name like that, it's like their Xbox game attack from 2004. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that, that is the other thing as well. Yeah, it could potentially be that. <laughs> Amusingly, it's now my Xbox game there you attack. Go. <laughs> yeah. it's, gone, so, it's gone full circle, but the other way. So. Yeah, literally. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the other thing is, sort of personal branding hat on. My real name is Alexander. Alex is a pretty common name. So there is only one Quipster, but there are many Alexes. Exactly. Yeah. So every time you say Quipster, you're either thinking about me or a small alternative Austrian clothing brand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You try and get an endorsement and then, it, then they, literally. Oh, so funny. So I, I know someone who's German and they happen to be going through Austria at one point and they sent me a picture of like the Quipster shop and they were like, <laughs> what the hell is this? And I was just like, oh my God. So I have a Quips the t-shirt. That's amazing. Perfect. That's amazing. That's absolutely brilliant. Okay. Well, uh, what is your sort of background on the, the Warhammer stuff then? So okay. we, we, you was vlogging, I guess. How does that become Warhammer? Let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to the very beginning of the, the you know, Quips to Warhammer journey. So I was nine years old. Yep. <laughs> this is 1999, before the Iraq war, before the <laughs> war on terror, all of this early Bush presidency. Okay. We've got pre-Bush, early Blair. This is so I've got a, my two degrees are in politics and international relations, and my master's in global political economy. So the way I judge eras is based on whoever's prime minister or president <laughs> at the time. I mean, I suppose it makes remembering the eras a bit better potentially because you've got that one point of well, better or worse, oh, yeah. I guess. Well, yeah, I, not so, not so, so much better. Using power at yeah, one hundred percent. So pre-war on terror, um, basically, I think this is actually a fairly. Um, universal experience for British men in their 30s. We all grew up, we all were on the high street in our local town. I'm from Watford originally. And I always used to go past this shop in the Harlequin. It was the big shopping center. And it was a games workshop. And it's always kind of like in a dark, tucked away corner. <laughs> and you kind of walk past it, and you're like, what is that? That looks cool. And, you know, I'd always walk past this shop and I'd never go in. And eventually it got to the point where I was just like, I plucked up the courage. I was like, you know what? Let's do this. Let's go in there. Let's see what this is about. 
So I walked into this game's workshop and immediately I was like, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. This is amazing. And it, the first games workshop I ever went into actually wasn't in uh, Watford. It was, I was visiting my, so I'm, this is one thing everyone's going to realize is that I'm a big rambler. So it's fine. That's okay. massive tangents. It's a podcast. Well, it's totally we've got, cool. You've got you exactly. and James in the same room. So this could go <laughs> one of two ways. It, it got deep pretty fast with the mention of the war on terror. So I don't, <laughs> we're pretty deep as it is. So we might as well just try and surface, but yeah, no, all good. Excellent. So yeah, my, um, I'm, my background no, ethnically is I'm half Indian and uh, half Sri Lankan. Oh, wow. So on my dad's side, I've got my grandpa and my grandma. But on my mum's side, I have my, my Indian side, I have my Ba and my Bapaji. Ba and Bapaji lived in Leicester. And so I was up visiting them in Leicester. And because uh, a lot of Indians there, it's a big community. And um, there's a games workshop there. Yeah, yeah. So I walked past and I was like, you know what? Let's do this. Went in as a nine-year-old and... I looked around, I was like, this is the best thing I've ever seen because they had this amazing diorama mm. and it was weirdly, um, presciently, um, a diorama of hormigants versus uh, imperial fists mm. on a giant dam. Mm. And the imperial fists have been modeled to be like firing down the dam yeah, yeah. as this like, cool, like crazy cool last stand. I'm looking at this and it was amazing because you've got the hormigants like punching holes in the dam, like climbing up. And it was this big wave. I'm like, this is, I want this. This is amazing. And I, I, don't, I don't know if you guys remember this. I don't know if you're old enough to remember this. <laughs> Jesus. But, uh, I definitely am. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when you walked in and you were like, oh, I'm new, they gave you this little like pamphlet yeah. thing. Yeah. And it had all the different Space Marine chapters mm. and like all the different color schemes. And I went, it was only like six pages long, but I remember going over that for hours, yeah. being like, the Eagle Warriors, the Nova Marines, these are these are so cool. What yeah. am I going to do? And so, yeah, that was my first ever introduction to it. And then I badgered my dad afterwards. I was like, dad, I, I want to do this. This this seems really cool. My dad, my dad's like a science nerd because he, <laughs> he did his, my dad's the weirdest has the weirdest journey ever because like he was a cowboy like <laughs> <laughs> I did not expect you to say that. Like, Honestly, it's, like, my family history is so bizarre. Like, my dad worked, did his first degree in economics, realized he hated economics, and like had to save up money for his next degree, uh, which was going to be in pharmacology. And so, first, he was a cowboy in Calgary, like literally as a cattle rancher. And then he worked on an ice breaking ship. And then when he was at uni, he was a road sweeper and then a pizza chef. Right. Okay. <laughs> and that's, like, I mean, it, I'm I'm always one for varied experience, but that's just that's just that's just insane. Like. Yeah. And then he became an overseas director for AstraZeneca. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> what? It's the weirdest CV you've I mean, ever that's, seen. That's a solid. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of CVs in my time in recruitment, but that's just, that's pretty solid. Like, it, it's just so wild. And so, like, he was like a massive science nerd, but not an anything else nerd. And there's me, I remember, because he would do a lot of like overseas trips. And he told me a story once of how my mum was picking him up from the airport after a big business trip and brought me and I was wearing a full Thunderbirds costume. <laughs> Respect for Thunderbirds. I grew up, um, uh, this is going to be a podcast uh, official statement. I grew mm. up with Thunderbird wallpaper as a child. Nice. So yeah, it's just, just right there. Go with it. Excellent. I, I, I skipped the generation perfectly because I grew up with Thunderbirds as well, but it was like the reboot. Oh so. no, <laughs> you get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so like I remember <laughs> my dad told me that story and he was just like, oh God. <laughs> No, fair, totally. So did, did, was he, did he like encourage it or did he like... I think he, my dad was very tolerant about these things. Cause, tolerant? Because <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> yeah, like, my, my dad's side are all very sporty. So my dad was a rower, he was a rugby player, but not a nerd at okay. all. But just he liked science as well. And so when I was into like Star Trek, Star Wars and, and Warhammer eventually, it's always very supportive. Yeah, yeah. Like when the... I didn't grow up with the original uh, Star Wars, but when they got re-released in 97... Uh, beginning the first Labour government um, in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> like that he's using governmental timeframes. Oh, it's perfect time timeline. No, it's working really well. Yeah. <laughs> so early Tony Blair, um, they had the re-release of Star Wars, and you know my dad took me to. Um, there was a local cinema. He said, "Okay, close your eyes. I've got a surprise for you." And he took me to the car park of the cinema, and there was this big thing happening, and they had brought a full X-wing. 
to the sit to the cinema car park, and he kind of like had me close my eyes. I open my eyes, and I'm in an X wing, and I was just like, "This is a what?" So that was amazing. And then also, you know, swinging it back back to Warhammer, um, my dad bought me the third edition um, like box set. Right. Oh right, yeah, right. Yeah, box. it was the the Black Templars, Templars and the Elder. and the not the new at Dark the time Elder. the new Dark Elder, and oh my god, that was a that was literally life changing. Yeah. Because I got that box, and number one, it had you know the metal special edition uh, Capt- uh, Marshall, Marshall, yeah, yeah, the one who's like this, yeah, yeah. Um, It had that in it. Yeah, that's a great and box. That's how we discovered that super glue really doesn't work on really small joints. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a great box to get into it because you had uh, the first Mark One plastic uh, tactical squad. Yeah. So it wasn't the it wasn't the stock pose second edition one. That was the box where the first new plastic set was done. That's when the land speeder came out in that box as well. That was great. Was it in that yeah, box? Yeah, land speeder was the first wow. first plastic land speeder was in that box. God, that um, was an awful kit. And, <laughs> and and the jungle trees. So Yes. Yeah, I remember so, that. And the, yeah. the tiny little uh, bits of like ruin as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. That was a great box actually. And the code uh, the the code it's the rule book on that one was the uh the really it was a super grim dark one that had mm. loads of John Blanche in it. Like it was yeah, it was I think all the there was very other than the colour photographs of like models and stuff everything was black and white like all the artwork it was like if you like grim dark the third edition rule book is like amazing so so yes 100 nice. so, like so just to kick that timeline along a little bit then so okay. did you have the famous break everyone talks about doing it when they was in the childhood and then what happens okay. teenage years stops being cool as adam skinner said you discover beer and women yeah oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, okay, this is where the story starts getting a little bit serious. Okay. So, um, I actually had two breaks. Okay. So, my first break was, you know, I said, this is why I mentioned my dad. So, my dad got um, sent by his company to India. Okay. So, I went from a school in St. Albans, which is like near where I live, to um, having to go to boarding school because okay. my whole family left and went to India. So, I went to a boarding school actually near here, uh, near Chelmsford. It was oh, called, okay. Called Felsted. Okay. And um, I obviously kind of had to drop the hobby because, you know, I didn't want to get bullied that badly. <laughs> <laughs> it, so, was still, it was still the lowdown at that time. Yeah, so, a little bit, yeah. Because, yeah. so, yeah. you know, this yeah. is pre-Instagram, Facebook. Yeah. Like, yeah. these don't exist yet. And so this is pre-Wi-Fi. I think Jesus. it's pre-Nokia 3310, isn't it, at that point? I think kind of, yeah. yeah. God, how old am I? Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I went to boarding school and I dropped the hobby because... I was not popular with the women, but uh, <laughs> didn't want to like bring all my stuff with me to school. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is kind of where things get a little bit more serious because in boarding school is where I developed uh, chronic illness. Okay. Um, so I have something called ulcerative colitis, mm-hmm. which is where your large intestine isn't recognized as part of your body. Mm-hmm. So your immune system attacks it. I had a really bad attack of it when I was about 13 or 14 um, and had to have my large intestine removed. Oh, wow. That's why I've got a very slim waist. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, narrow Asian hips. I get it from my mum's side. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so this becomes very relevant to the later part of the story. But, uh, yeah, boarding school, I took a big break. And then, because of my illness, I actually, I missed half my GCSEs. And then I had to repeat lower sixth. Mm. Um, and the first time I did lower sixth, I missed the whole first term. And I was doing something called the International Baccalaureate, mm-hmm. which is like... Instead of doing, like, at the time you did four A-levels and you dropped one, it's like doing seven A-levels. So if you miss a whole term, you can't really catch up. And so I had to repeat lower sixth and change school. So my parents, by this point, and my whole family had come back to the UK. So I moved back home and went to a local state school in Watford. And the funniest thing ever happened. You think, like, okay, moving to a state school in Watford, like, with a posh accent like mine, my first day, I was like, oh, am I going to get stabbed? Like, <laughs> what's what's going to happen? Because like, I'd never been to a state school before. And so my only experience of what a state school would be like was the in-betweeners. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, oh, God. And I, and like, literally, I'm walking in like, oh, I might just will from the in-betweeners. Like, what's going to happen here? Jesus Christ. Oh God. <laughs> and so I walk in. And obviously, like the first week of sixth form, they uh, they do like a big like everyone gets to re know each other again, mm-hmm. like team building, all this kind of stuff. And so we were coming back from one of these, and uh, we were all in a coach together the whole year. And it's the first week; I don't really know anyone. And 
my now good friend Dom leans over the the seats on the coach and uh, he tells a Warhammer joke. Oh wow! And, and I know what Warhammer is, so I laugh along. And Dom looks me straight in the eyes, and he's just like, "You don't know what we're laughing about." And I was like, "Yeah, I do." And he was like, "No, no, you don't." It's like, "Yeah, I do." <laughs> and he was like, "By all the nests, she's one of us." Yeah. <laughs> I think that's one of the, one of the things I always liked about school is that you, you'd find you'd find commonalities with people like with, with science fiction and stuff like that. And then I I I, I had my my break. I didn't really have at, at school exactly. It was on the lowdown, so I didn't really do it much at school. Uh, it was only towards the later part of or maybe year year ten eleven where I kind of like started picking it up again. Um, but yeah, I I know exactly what you mean when you get that connection with somebody and you're like. They know, they know. Oh they know. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's it's pretty good. It's like we, we can we can chat later when everyone's not talking. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And it was so funny because like there was actually a group of friends at school who all knew each other, had known each other for years, and all played Warhammer. So as soon as Dom said that, instant group of friends. Yeah, that's amazing. I was like, this could not have worked out any better. Yeah, and it was so funny because everyone played a different faction in the group. Oh wow! And I turned into at the time the Tau guy. I was like, there's always one. There's always one. There's always one. 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 (laughs) And so, yeah, because I love Gundam. I love mechs. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think, obviously, as a lot of us are, I'm a big anime guy as well. And my, it's a bit hardcore introduction. The first anime I ever watched was Neon Genesis Evangelion, Mm. which is as as an intro. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. I'm not super into anime personally, but you get the hell out. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, Neon Genesis Evangelion and Gundam Wing are pretty hardcore intros to anime. And so when I saw the towel first come out, I was like, yes, straight away. Yeah. And so, yeah, throughout school, that was my my first getting back into the hobby. Oh, I forgot towel wasn't in one of the first factions, was it? There was that. No, it wasn't no, it? Right. I think, I think, yeah. that, did that I, align with when it had I, been released then? Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. And so, yeah, was playing a lot of Warhammer with the guys. I think it was fifth edition at the time. And uh, then went to uni, discovered parties and girls, and actually amusingly fencing, which became kind of the big focus of my life while I was at uni. That mm-hmm. wasn't my degree. <laughs> um, and so... No one's focus is their degree while they're at uni. <laughs> oh, I didn't go, so I'm not going to comment. <laughs> oh, I loved uni. I thought it was amazing. Good to do everything. And I remember at the time, to my shame, I remember, because I thought Warhammer was a part of my life that I just left behind. Mm. And so I remember seeing the Warhammer Club at uni and being like, come on, guys. Let's, let, let's grow up. <laughs> How the tables have turned. You became one of them. I became one. The, 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 the naysayers of Warhammer. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I think at that kind of age, you're not very comfortable with who you are. You're still finding your footing yeah. and you're just like, oh, I don't do childish things anymore. I'm an adult. You're bloody not. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, so I dropped out of the hobby. And then it became, it must have been 2017. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. It was the end of 2018. Mm. And what had happened with me is with chronic illness stuff, the surgery that I had um, stopped me from having effects from the actual illness, but I got after effects from the surgery. Mm. And so I was going through a really bad bout of uh, illness sort of like throughout 2017 and 18. And it got to the end of 2018. And I was just like, there's only so much Metal Gear Solid 5 I can play. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which I know is going to be a shock to some people because I absolutely love the Metal Gear Solid games. I mean, you collected Tau. I mean, I don't see the, <laughs> seeing the similarity there. No, that's fine. Yeah. So I realized, okay, I, I need to be able to be doing something while I'm feeling ill. Mm-hmm. Like, I want to just be able to be ill and sit there and do a thing. And so I think it must have been a Facebook ad. And I'm, I'm scrolling things on Facebook and I suddenly see Warhammer. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, I wonder what's happening with Warhammer these days. And then I saw a model of a custodian. And I was just like, oh my God. (laughs) And because like I had always loved the custodies um, since the third edition rule book, because there's two custodies in that book. Yeah. And I always thought, who are those guys? That's really, they look really cool. And so I went on the Games Workshop website and I thought, custodies are a faction. I'm in, full stop. I went straight to the Games Workshop on Tottenham Court Road and dropped 400 pounds on a full custodian. Army. Not laughing at the Warhammer Club now, are you? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so jump straight in. And then I called my guys from school, put them all in a big WhatsApp group. And I was like, yo, guys, I'm getting back into Warhammer. Do, you, do any of you want to join me? Every single one of them. 
And so, yeah, that's how I got back into Warhammer. That's amazing. I'd imagine there's probably a lot of people who um, sort of lost touch with it and all they probably needed was an olive branch of yeah. like one of their old squad yep. picking it back up. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a little spark. Just yeah. a little spark of plastic and we're, uh, we're back in. Honestly, all it took was like the <laughs> barest of nudges, every single one of them straight back in. Because by this point, we're all in our late 20s. You know, mo- actually most of them were married or in long-term relationships and they're kind of, I think, looking for something to do that doesn't involve a screen. Yeah, yeah. And like brings us together. Yeah. And so that's what Warhammer's really good for. Mm. So yeah, that's that was the journey. And it's been just downhill ever since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, moving on then, I guess, to <laughs> present day. What is the sort of content you're doing now? What is everyone knows you for now? So I never expected to sort of be in this position where I have a lot of followers. One thing I think a lot of people don't, realize about instagram and social media in general is that it's almost another hobby by itself Mm -hmm. there are theories there are techniques there are things to do because like one of my other big things i was doing before warhammer in the sort of like post uni period for me was photography i can i looked at my um uh account the other day i took fifteen thousand pictures in 2018 and edited about five thousand of them wow Okay. And so that's where my photography background comes from. And I think that's really helped with Warhammer stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, that and, you know, video editing. And so I, I was always looking for that creative outlet in that way. Mm-hmm. And I was doing sort of Warhammer on top. And so they seem to have married really well. And so, yeah, they kind of like went really well together. And that's how I started making content. It was kind of an accident just getting lots of followers like that. Um, I think people really respond to the way I present how I do my hobby. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the moment, <laughs> a lot of funny things happened when I, when I got back into the hobby. Started making content, then lockdown hit. <laughs> and it was a funny thing. I'm totally like taking a tangent from the question you asked, but uh, lockdown was a funny thing because everyone at the time was like, oh, this is the worst thing ever, where I'm like, I've had a chronic illness. I'm, I'm used to this. Like, I'm good. I've been and training for this my whole life. <laughs> kind of. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> like all my fellow chronic illness people will know this, but like we're used to long periods of time alone. That's fair. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so in that time period, a lot of things started kind of happening and moving. Mm-hmm. Um, I became a lot closer with all of my hobby friends because we spent every minute of every day together painting on that app house party yep or playing call of duty oh my together. god i forgot about house party it like, was so good right <laughs> I, I didn't really i just remember it being the thing during, during yeah. the pandemic yeah it was so good because like i knew a bunch of the old um like dc tv crowd mm-hmm. and i ended up introducing them all to my london friends because of house party because we were all on together and then we all played call of duty together that's mega like my first ever win on call of duty warzone was with winters oh wow oh, really that's, yeah that's ice oh, what was <laughs> that for warzone during oh, lockdown was incredible so oh. good god i missed that that was literally like my entire my, that game became my, my entire life it was my reason to wake up mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like yep. oh but i was like oh i've got to go to bed now but don't worry 9 a.m oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was like <laughs> It was like Warzone and like our hour long mental health walk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Gonna have a walk in the park and we're gonna play Warzone for 12 hours and say that that made up for it. <laughs> 100%. And so, yeah, out of that, we like a bunch of people in that group, we actually started making content because, you know, we're all men in our late 20s and 30s. We're like, you know what we should do? We should start a podcast because everyone <laughs> must hear about our opinions. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's what we did. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. And so, me and uh, a couple of other guys, we started the Conclave. Yep. And that became a big thing. We were used to podcasting and it really like helped, you know, satisfy those creative urges. And then from there, a couple of us had to drop out of the, out of, uh, the Conclave. I, I know it's still going, mm-hmm. so that's good. But since then, so sort of in the more modern time, uh, 2024, I've been doing a lot on Instagram, but I want to do more. Um, one thing that's been holding me back a lot is, and you guys will know this business. Yeah. So yeah, I, I work with my family in the um, skincare industry. We own a skincare brand and it's a lot of work. Yeah. So we're actually in the process of moving premises right now. And, um, I work with my mom and I was talking to my mom and I was like, look, one of the things we're going to need is a studio. Selfishly, like part of me is thinking like <laughs> multi-purpose <laughs> studio. I can use that for other stuff, but also we're going to need to make like skincare content and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, that's 
the next thing I'm working on is studio awesome. um, in our new premises so that I can make more YouTube content. Because a while ago, I'm a really bad influence. I had to put that out there. So <laughs> An influencer who's a bad influence. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm terrible. So like the reason I mentioned fencing while I was at uni is because I seem to have made something happen. There is now a fencing to Warhammer pipeline. Right, okay. Like it is a thing. Loads of like fences and either used to play Warhammer or have gotten back into it. Really? Yeah. It's so wild. Like that's not a crossover you'd expect not, necessarily. Well, a, a lot of models hold swords in 40k. So so like yeah, okay. yeah, but other than that, I'm not seeing much similarity. Yeah, but the thing is, do you find yourself critiquing the stance of models that have got swords and stuff like that? Do you genuinely a hundred percent yes? Yeah, I, I knew that was, I, so like can you look at something like he's not he's not he's not that doing you would sound the, like the that. right guard or he's not doing the right Yeah. Even to the point where this is a thing that gets me in films, especially. Um, for the most part, swords don't have grips that are round. Mm. because if the if the grip is round, you don't know where the edge is when you're holding the sword. And so if you swing it, you can hit them with the flat. All oh, right. So swords, generally speaking, have like an octagonal grip like a tennis racket. Mm -hmm. So you know where the edge is. Every sword in Warhammer has a circular grip. Uh, <laughs> it bothers me to no end. Easy for, easy for pinning though, however. That's, that's the, <laughs> yeah, that's true, thing, yeah. true. What are your plans next for, for your content creation in this new studio you're making? It's actually funny you mentioned that. So... The biggest video I've made so far was a painting tutorial for a buddy of mine. His name's Raf. And um, Raf was one of my good friends at uni in the fencing team. And, you know, just after we graduated, we'd always talk about, you know, Warhammer and stuff. And eventually he was like, yo, I think I want to get into this. And I said, okay, Raf, I got you. He, he wanted to do Black Templars. So I said, okay, I'll make you a tutorial of how to paint Black Templars. That video now has like 85,000 views. I'm so, I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's the style I want to make content in. It's really good. Like really, really Thank good. You. Yeah, it's an informal video and the, the way you present it, the way you go through stuff is really good. Um, but there's obviously a myriad of, of YouTube tutorials out there, but I think the concise instruction and steps, I think is one of the things I think that Black Tempo one that you've done really helps someone follow the process from beginning to end quite, quite efficiently, which is good. It's quite nice that you've kind of found your own style as well, because I think one of the best... It's easy to say like, oh, YouTube's so oversaturated with like tutorials, but I think it's quite nice because you kind of pick the guy that is doing the thing that you want, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like if you're not a really high-end display painter who's painting for competitions, mm -hmm. you're not going to get any value out of an Infernal Brush tutorial. Yeah. But if you're someone who's just, you know, a hobbyist and you want to get your army done quick, Peachy's your guy or... And, or there, maybe there's someone who does like a videography style that you like, or maybe they explain things in a certain way. Yeah. So I think that it's yeah. nice when people find that kind of groove and they're not trying to just follow the path of someone else, if that makes sense. hundred percent. And I think, I think a mistake a lot of content creators make is they look at what a lot of people have done before and think that's the way to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they look only at the Warhammer sort of sphere. Mm -hmm. My editing style is taken absolutely not from Warhammer at all. Mm -hmm. I copy YouTubers like KSI, Mr. Beast, mm -hmm. you know, Casey Neistat. That's the background I use for those. And that's why the editing style is actually quite different to a lot of Warhammer videos. And that's why, like, for example, um, I can't remember if it was John. No, it was Dan Abnett mm -hmm. in an interview when he talked about writing. Mm -hmm. A lot of people come to him and they ask, oh, um, I want to be a writer. What should I do? The first thing he said to them was read and read widely. If you want to write Warhammer novels, he was basically saying, don't just read Warhammer novels. Yeah. Read everything. And it's the same with making content, especially on YouTube watch a broad variety of things and go, ah, I can take this. Ah, I can take that. And combine them in a way that's unique to you. And I think that's something a lot of Warhammer people don't do as much because Warhammer as a hobby is a very all-encapsulating hobby. Of course it is, yeah. We eat, sleep, and drink this hobby. Yeah. Like, I go to bed and I'm thinking about painting schemes or I'm thinking about law or something like that. And so it can be very easy to be, be stuck inside the bubble. I, th I think that's one of the things that I, I noticed, obviously, from when I when I started, because I actually started doing my own YouTube videos before Siege. Like that's how that's the first thing I've done. Like, oh, I got, know. Got my stuff out. Of lock. <laughs> got my stuff out. Of lock. We found the videos. Yeah, James. I know, yeah. I our know, listeners yeah. found the videos. We set a they challenge, did. and they, it was like twenty minutes after our podcast episode had got up. So I was I, like, "Here's the link." <laughs> I was I was definitely definitely more Essex back then. Um, uh, but um, so the interesting thing you said, which really really sort of like I, I warmed to massively, is that like a lot of the stuff that was in our industry back then was very much. Much, um, almost like a, a, the vloggy style where you're vlogging yourself and there's no like really crazy production or like any of that kind of stuff. And it's only really been in the last 
probably say like three to five years where you've seen a huge jump in commercial kind of nature within the industry as it's as it's grown and that's that's obviously gone with companies but at the same time the way that content is produced has changed massively it's way more way more produced like commercial it's not just with like new people either because i've noticed there's a lot of channels who have maybe been around for like say five to ten years and you can watch their content shift Mm. kind of like post 2020 yeah. Like, I feel like um, people might be a bit worried they're going to be left behind yeah. with the way that content shifts. Me and James speak about this all the time, like um, privately. Is It's interesting how a lot of the Warhammer bubble um, in terms of content, it kind of rejects things from outside of it. Like mm-hmm. it's almost like you've kind of got to try and force new things. On, like, because it's not that they won't necessarily do well, but like with this podcast, for example, I'm a big fan of podcasts more broadly speaking. I've never really listened to many Warhammer podcasts at all. So when we came into this, I wanted to take the things that I liked from other podcast formats and didn't want to just do it in the same way that everyone else was doing it. But we noticed early on, particularly with like the way we was branding like thumbnails and things like that, there was kind of this like pushback of like, oh, this isn't the this isn't the Warhammer thing. It's not the Warhammer way. And, and, I, and I, get, I get that totally. But I think that's one of the things that for me, I always say this, like our industry is 40 years old. Okay. We've been around over a decade. So we're a quarter age of the industry. And even within that time frame, things have changed. Like within their 10 years uh, or 11 years, it's changed massively. But a lot of things that I noticed early on is when I, when I got into the industry doing Siege or like whatever, is that there's loads of things outside of wargaming that are perfectly normal and that companies and content creators or like channels or whatever do that our industry just doesn't doesn't do it always mm. looks in like in an insular way rather than looking to the things that are outside for influence or for like oh well, that's a really good way of doing it why don't i try and wrap that with warhammer and do it within the industry do you know what i mean i so, think yeah. that's part of what you said though quipster is like because it's so like all encompassing it's so people are so attached to it yeah and like it's so deep on it i think people get very very emotional about the way that they do it and other people do it and the way things are presented like everyone's yeah. very precious about it maybe in a way that they aren't with other industries, if that makes sense. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, one thing I think is very different about Warhammer compared to Smear Gaming is that because you spend so much time building and painting an army or reading the books, that you've got this emotional attachment to the narrative and the world as it is and the way you've consumed content to get that knowledge in a way that doesn't exist in many other mediums. Mm -hmm. Um, I th- the the only sort of comparable things I can think of would be <laughs> people are going to give me crap for this. Um, <laughs> Taylor Swift is one. You don't just listen to her music; you become part of the Taylor Swift culture. Right. Sure, okay. Swifties are a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot to do with it, and there's a lot of emotional investment there. Yeah. You go to the shows; you become part of the groups. Yeah, it's kind of similar with Warhammer there. We are we are the Swifties of the Grim Dark. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I completely uh, I like accept that massively. I think that's one of the things. Like it's a very I always say that that this industry and the hobby is is very singular. Like I know there are people who are big fans of Star Wars or like Star Trek or like all these other different different cults that are out there in that sense. But um, Warhammer has got so much depth to it whether it's fantasy whether it's 40k or any of the little nuanced different sort of side games or side stories and stuff it's so deep with its richness and flavor that you almost can't help but become part of part of that group because of the immersion that you get from it well you you, you rarely meet someone who just dabbles with warhammer yeah yeah it's, it's so true but like, i mean they exist but it's rare that you find someone who's like oh yeah i've got like you know a few space marines that i paint you know once every three months you know mm-hmm. dust them off like it's always you go full beans. Hard. Yeah, full beans. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think a big reason for that as well is the time investiture and the fact that one thing I kind of wanted to talk about and get your perspective of from you guys is what you guys think of the new player experience. Because I've guided a bunch of people, like men and women, into you know being actually quite big parts of the hobby. Yeah, yeah. And so one thing I've realized is that the new player experience isn't a learning curve. It's a learning cliff. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. It's uh, the people initially balk at the price, especially when you first get into it, mm-hmm. because it's got a lot of upfront loaded costs. Of course it adds, yeah. Models, Blade, tools, paints, paints brushes. And it's every little thing you don't already have, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. It's exactly. like, oh, that tiny little file that you didn't know you had. That's, and those like five, six quids just rack up. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to say this. We don't really help because we're, we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're always promoting a new paint or something that we really love. I'm super guilty of that. You're, <laughs> you're totally right though because I, I got into the hobby uh, only five years ago. So 
I know, and I was starting completely from scratch. And it was like, I remember distinctly, like I'd spent like 50, 60 quid on the starter box and then another like 50, 60 quid on all the paints, which was a lot of money to me. I was at, I was at uni. And then I remember like starting to paint and realizing like there was like a couple of things I didn't have. And it's like, I already spent all my money. Like, and then yeah. those costs were just like racking up and racking up and racking up. And what I thought was going to be like this, I'm going to try this thing. It will cost me, you know, a couple hundred quid and then that'll be it ends up just, you know, snowballing and you realize exactly. you're in for kind of, it's too late. I, you know? I, I would say though, that like, comparable to other, other sort of hobbies and things like if you, I've got friends that fish, I've got friends that do like all manner of different, like, like I've got friends that do, uh, uh, air rifle shooting or like clay pigeon shooting, fencing. Like fencing. Like, <laughs> they, I, I, I understand totally that there is a massive upfront cost. Like when you get into most hobbies, I think probably the, one of the only ones I could think of just off the cuff that, that gives you a comparable experience, maybe no painting involved is chess. You buy a chess set, you play chess with your friends or you get risk and that's that's as close as you're going to get to Warhammer. But like, I think with any hobby, you're going to have some form of like, bar- not I don't want to say barrier to entry because it's not like a gatekeeper. I, I know thing, what you're like, saying. I know like, what you're getting at though. Like other hobbies are very expensive and it's in a comparison I hear a lot and I think it's fair. I think the difference is once you kind of get the stuff in those other hobbies, you've got it and now you can just start practicing. Whereas yeah. with Warhammer, it seems like you're kind of constantly having to yeah, there accrue, is you know, supplies yeah. and stuff. And then I oh, was a new YouTube video I came out and they was using this and they told me that I need to have this, this, and yeah. this. It is- There's a new rule book and then you're just constantly like being drained maybe. So I have a kind of controversial opinion about this. Yeah. Are we ready for some controversy? Go for it. Go, go. Uh, let's make a good reel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think Warhammer is actually really good value for money. I'm so glad you said that. Right. Because be- I am so glad you said that. Because the thing is, is my opinion on it is that once you bought them, you painted them. Okay. And I always say this as a joke. Unless you lose it, someone steals it, it catches fire or you sell it, you've always got it. Yeah. And because of, uh, th- this is going to segue a little bit, but I- I'll try and keep it on-, on brand and on topic. But like a lot of people who get into this, you you feel like I'm going to compare it to surfing, which is the craziest analogy ever. But like a lot of people ride the wave always. They try and stay on the wave. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Which I understand and I get. I think for me personally, in the last couple of years, one of the biggest things that changed my hobby for the better was not playing the game. And I know a lot of people love playing the game. I'm not knocking it. I still love throwing dice around now and again whenever I get an opportunity. But the, I, the thing I found most taxing for the other part of the thing, which I love more, obviously, which is painting, is following the wave. You've got all these lovely miniatures you spent hours invested time into, and you've got an addition that they perfectly slot and fit within where you don't need to make changes to them, et cetera. But when the addition changes, you feel that you've got to change everything. And that's why you're constantly, in my opinion, like in an uphill fight to, to, to ride the wave. Does that make sense? Try to stay relevant. Yeah, trying yeah, to stay relevant with it. With it. Yeah. There are plenty of people out there that still play second edition, that play third, that play fourth, they play fifth. There's people that play Battlefleet Gothic still. There's people that play Epic 40,000. There's, you've got loads of different groups where, for me personally, not riding the wave and staying on the wave was, for me, in my hobby and outside of work and outside of Siege, was the best thing I've decided to do because it meant I could just literally pick a model up, paint it, I get the enjoyment out of it, and that, that, that which ties directly to the thing that you're saying about value for money. I can buy kits now that sit in a drawer for 10 years or however many years, whatever. I just get them out and paint them. And that val- that money that I've spent is more valuable to me because I've got that thing always now. You know, I don't feel that, you know, that I've got to change my army because like the, the then you can no longer load them out. Or I, I had it before where I had a, a corn, a corn army that I, a, a world eaters army that I was doing and they all had chainsaws and chain axes and the rules changed and I'd modeled them all with chainsaws and chain axes. Now, got, so like there are things which, mean that you have to go back and change stuff or whatever but I, I do think you nailed it with value for money and I know the cost of stuff in the industry there's a lot of people who have different opinions on it etc I think we see things at face value and I think that like when you really strip behind it the production cost the mold cost the, the the cost of painting them the cost of designing them the cost of packaging the cost of shipping the cost of all the things that go into before we talk about business tax and any of those kind of things when you strip all that back for the value that you get for what you pay for it and the longevity of use and enjoyment of it, I think it is bang on what you said. It is, it is super value for me. One, one thing that's overlooked, I think, as well, is like it's easy to defend like the production costs, but I think like the value to the end user. So, for example, if, yeah. I, if I explained to my mum <laughs> that a box of Space Marines is like 40 quid, she'd be like, well, it's just plastic. Yeah. And, yeah. and I understand from a like materials, like tangible cost, you say like that's an insane amount of money for this thing. Mm. But I see that as... 150 hours of fun that I'm going to get. That's exactly how many it. people have a Steam library of video games that they paid full price for and they played it, you know, with their mate twice yeah. and then never picked it up again. 
that's a massive sink of of money. But yeah. people don't speak about video games being terrible value. Well, yeah. the, the, the way I, I'll, I'll compare it again to fishing, like I've got my friend that fishes. He he's, he he fish. He got into it massively, fished for ages, had a break of like three, four years, went back to the garage, got his fishing rods out. They're all seized up, rusty. Things are broken on them. Like, you know, he, he had some mice in his garage that went through all his bivvy, which is the tent thing that you go by. Like, like that, you put the models in a case or you magnetize them onto a tray and then put them in a case, whatever. They go in the cupboard for three, four, five, six years, seven, whatever. You get them out, ready to go. There's no, none of those things yeah. that happen yeah. with like, I understand there's an upfront cost, and I'll always say that caveat because there is, and it is, you know, it, it, for the investment. I know you like what you said to your mum. You can say it's just plastic or whatever, but I think it's totally down to circumstance as well. Because yeah. obviously, people yeah. are in a lot of different. It's easy to say when you can afford it, and when yeah. I understand the struggle of people that haven't got a lot of money and they do really love the hobby. Yeah, and then you know the prices yeah. go up and it gets more and more. Oh, difficult I completely they're, they're being that. priced out. I hear a lot of people yeah. saying like, "I'm getting priced out now," and I, I think that's. Yeah, I agree. That's something that I really sympathise with. I do, oh. wholeheartedly. Yep. But I, I, but the thing is, that's where eBay trading groups, and this is where the the amazing community that we've got it is really vital to that. If you're buying direct from a, from from RRP, obviously I understand what you're saying totally. But I'll still jump on eBay and buy it. if I want to buy a Predator or if I want to go and buy something. I, like if, you don't the, need an excuse. You know, <laughs> the, 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 other, the other thing, just to touch upon it as well, is that like I I actually as much as yeah, look, getting that lovely new fresh kit is great, and I love that massively and i'll always i still buy new and i still buy you know buy maybe i go to element or maybe i buy i do swing by games workshop and buy but buy a kit in there or whatever but for me especially where one bit time poor if i see a, a bile predator or whatever model on ebay fully built fully cleaned and just got an undercoat on it it's a no-brainer so like and i'm and i'm pretty sure i can get that for cheap and i can probably go down the go down to a shop and buy or whatever like so i think yeah. that there's always a way to get the models that you want you can trade with your friends. You can do like, there's, there's, this is the thing I keep touching upon is like the community we've got is absolutely amazing. And there's different avenues for, for, for people to get into it at different price points. There's, it's not like there's a permanent wall that you either have to climb it or you can't climb it. I don't, I don't think that's the case. Yeah. And I'd actually add two things to this as well. Number one, value for money doesn't mean not expensive. Yeah. Like, and I think your point about um, the time investiture is sort of the most important thing mm -hmm. because the way I compare it is going to the cinema. So you're going to spend, what, 35 quid going to the cinema? Yeah. Tickets, food, getting there, et cetera. 35, 40 quid maybe. That's a box of Space Marines. You're going to be at the cinema for about two, three hours. You're going to have that box of Space Marines and be painting them for what? Maybe 100 hours? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe less? Who knows? If you look at how much like how much money you're spending the per, cost hour. per hour the cost yeah. per hour for a space marine is wildly lower than most other hobbies yeah and at say. the end of it you've got the thing you've got a thing and if you really wanted to you could sell it you could use exactly. that money to buy another set exactly and like the other point i'd make about that is a lot of people ask me they're like or they say to me like oh it's so hard keeping up with the meta and my first question i ask them is why why are you bothering to keep up with the meta I think there's this thing that hobbyists think, especially if they're new into the hobby, like, I must have the latest, greatest thing. It's like, I mean, why? You don't need it. There is no need. Play the game your way. Yeah, we always say that. Yeah, that's what exactly. we say. Exactly. And I think that kind of comes from like traditional computer gaming as much as anything, because you have to play it with all the updates. You mm. have to play it with you know, X, Y, and Z patches. I think people don't quite understand in Warhammer sometimes when they come in new, oh, I can play it with whatever I want. Like, perfect example of this, I did a learning game for a couple of, um, for a couple of fencing friends. <laughs> <laughs> and I just made up a scenario. Mm. I just made up a rule set, basically. And I was just like, um, yeah, sure, that does that. Or like, okay, the way you score points is by doing X, Y, and Z. Mm. I'd made it up all on the spot. They didn't know the difference. But they had a fun time. Yeah, yeah. That's the most important thing. It, 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 it grassroots. That's kind of like for me what Warhammer was. It's getting around the table with your friends, having a laugh, and enjoying it, in creating some form of narrative, enjoying the game. I, I've played tournaments. I've gone to SN No Retreat. I've gone to different tournaments and stuff. I've gone to the Warhammer World ones before, like in, in over the years, etc. And I, I did enjoy it, and it was it was fun. And it's a great experience. And if you know, and obviously now the tournament scene is leagues from where where it used to be. You know, it's it's crazy compared to com, compared to how it used to be. But I think that's one of the beautiful things. Like you can ride the way, follow the meta, you know, and, and play tournaments and have an amazing time doing that. Or you can get your friends around the 
get your friends around, chuck some scenery on a table, sling some dice, make up some rules. Oh, your captain's failed the charge, but we'll let you re-roll it because he's got this artifact or whatever. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you can do stuff like that and have an, still have an amazing time. Hmm. And that value for money is is continuous from the moment you, you do it. Also, the other thing I would say as well is that, like, again, comparing it to other hobbies like fishing or whatever. I know I don't know why I keep bringing up fishing, but anyway, <laughs> but. Okay, I keep bringing those, up fencing. Those, yeah. those, those, those things diminish in value. I would, I would argue, especially considering what we do as a business, that the work that you put in to the miniatures increases the value of the of the models that you actually work on. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so actually, the time you're spending is increasing the worth of those 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 gaming pieces or those that collection of miniatures more than what you spent out in other hobbies. Like, I, I'm not. George had a go at me the other day for calling computer games video games or whatever. They, they, no, they, you you always say, instead of video games, you always say computer games. Computer games, And he yeah. said, the reason I pulled him up on this oh, God, was yeah. because uh-huh. James said, have you seen the new Space Marine gameplay? I'm really excited. I think I'm going to buy an Xbox 5. Yeah. Yeah, I got, I got PlayStation. <laughs> I mean, I, that's how, how, that's how out of touch you. That's how out of touch I am with, computer, with gaming. Right? Okay, I'm quite happy to admit that. I'm not fussed at all. Yes. Um, if they do bring out an Xbox 5, I will be trading on <laughs> Um No, but... Um, but Space Marine 2 is like the first time I've mm. seen a game. I mean, I played Space Marine. I had an Xbox and I played Space Marine. That's how long ago uh, last time I played a computer game or video game or whatever <laughs> it is you want me to call it. Um, but um, but yeah, I think like, I, I, that's all going to be new for me. So that's going to be really interesting. I don't know half the stuff about, oh, you, you have to buy extra. I, I don't know any of that. Like that's 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 foreign to me, you know? So so um, that that's going to be interesting. But like, I think I will have a complete different perspective on value when I do go through that because I'll be like right well I've just paid all this out for this I'll play the game for I don't know how long the game is you're going to join us when you realise that you've spent 450 quid you put the game on you're like what microtransactions <laughs> <laughs> what's this what, what, what's which going we on? have to buy the paint jobs yeah yeah. I, so that's that's the thing that's all going to be new for me and, and the thing is that I will definitely be buying the Blood Angel paint jobs um, <laughs> but um, but um, but, uh, but yeah like so, so for value and things like that like I I I would always say to somebody new coming into it, explain those things that we've discussed and say, look, like, you know, there's a lot of information out there. And I've got, I've got, to, I've got to also say like YouTube and Instagram and all these other platforms have only made, I think that cliff edge, which is the perfect thing that what you described it and called it. I think they've only made that cliff edge even higher and more steep because you get into it, you go down, you go, I think the best way to get into it is for a friend who says, right. So this is, this is, a bit about the setting and background and you have that little immersion and you go, right, here's, your, here's a model. Let's try and paint it. You need to do this first, blah, blah, blah. I think that getting into it through a friend rather than going, now finding a shop, finding out about it and then jumping on Google and having a quick search or jumping on YouTube is like the scariest thing ever because there's mm-hmm. so much stuff out there now. Um, so I think it's I think it's all the, all the stuff that's happened over the last... 10 years with social media and yeah. and uh and and just youtube and the and the, the growth of youtube and its commercial and its commercial nature that's that's made that cliff edge even higher and higher and higher for people if you're a fan of the show and you want to support us then you should know that we have dropped some awesome merch on the siege studios shop we've got several shirt designs with this really cool graphic on it which has loads of cool painting nods and references I've been wearing mine all of the time for months now and I genuinely get compliments constantly from people who have absolutely no idea what warhammer is the shirts are really nice, high quality cotton, and everything is in stock and dispatched by us. None of that print to order nonsense. So if you want to check out the designs for yourself and see the other merch that we have on the shop, head to the link in this episode's description or go to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. And if you use the code POD10 at checkout, you'll save 10% and you'll get a free sticker pack with your order. Okay, let's swing it around to painting then, because yep. this is a painting podcast <laughs> after all. I, t- I totally forgot. Totally ridiculous. <laughs> so we've spoken about like your hobby background. How one thing we've sort of skipped over. You're a very good painter. Yeah. Oh, thank you. How how did you learn to paint? Was it like just something that you mm. picked up along the way? Like, because you said like about like you obviously got some very popular tutorials and stuff online. How did you establish that knowledge base, so to speak? It's a really good question. So. I, as a kid, didn't have a sporting background, but at university, I really did. Mm -hmm. Um, I was fencing three times a week. I was in the gym three times a week. I was rock climbing once or twice a week, doing a lot and like longboarding on the top as well. And the way you get good at anything is the same in any activity. Mm -hmm. Um, Zumikito Miniatures actually did an interesting video on this and um, it's true. There are four stages of mastering anything. Um, Unconscious incompetence. So 
you don't know enough about something to understand how bad you are in it. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Next stage is conscious incompetence. You know enough to understand how bad you are at a thing. <laughs> yeah. Then conscious competence. Mm -hmm. You understand enough and you're able to do a thing, but it takes a lot of conscious effort. Mm -hmm. The example I always use is tying your shoelaces. It take, you, can, you can tie your shoelaces, but it takes a lot of effort. You have to think through every stage. And then the last stage of mastery is unconscious competence. Muscle memory. Muscle memory. Yeah. You don't have to think about it. You can just tie your shoelaces without thinking. And the way to get from each stage to the next is hours, practice. Mm -hmm. And like I'm a very big subscriber to this idea of, um, I think it's Edward Said, did the 10,000 hours. So what he was talking about was it takes 10,000 hours of practice to become world-class at something. Mm -hmm. And I 100% agree with that. But I add the caveat of it doesn't take 10,000 hours of practice. It takes 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. 100%. Like you can paint Space Marine Army after Space Marine Army and just do the same thing you did every time and you won't get any better as a painter. Mm -hmm. What it takes is thinking about what am I trying to do? What am I trying to improve every single time? Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of how I started into the hobby. I like came from that sport background and I thought, okay, I want to, I want to get good at this. And so it's lots of incremental increases in skill over a long period of time and to do by doing multiple projects. So when I first got back into the hobby, it was with custodies. And I thought to myself, these models are beautiful. <laughs> this is amazing. I want to be able to do them justice. Now, this may come as a shock. I'm a bit of a show off. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfectly fine to be, to be up front. That's the best way to be. Yeah. And so I was just like, okay, I want these to be good. Yep. And that was my thought process going in. So one of my big virtues, I think, is patience. Mm -hmm. I don't really care how long something takes. Mm -hmm. I'm very willing to just put the, the time in to just do it. Yeah, yeah. And so when I was planning out my custodies, fortuitously, um, they're a very low model count army. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to be like, okay, I'm going to batch paint these in twos because I can. And so I was very deliberate in everything I did. And I spent a lot of time thinking about the color scheme. What do I want to do with this? And this is kind of something that's gone on with every painting project I've done since. I work on a technique at a time. Mm -hmm. So my custodies are my edge highlighted army. So I spent the whole time working on my edge highlights, uh, making everything very neat, working on those very simple techniques. Mm -hmm. One thing that I've had friends in the past who have been big on social media and they get criticism um, online. I'm going somewhere with this. Okay, it's all right. uh, they get criticism online from a lot of different places and it can really affect them. And the one thing I always have to say to them is, okay, go on that person's profile who's just said a mean thing to you. And we'll look at the profile and inevitably their painting is bad. Mm -hmm. And so I have to turn to whoever it is and say, look, don't take advice from people who can't base coat. It's the one fundamental skill that might sound really mean. No, no. But I, I, I always, it's something I always say when it comes to critique and feedback, like when you're looking for critique and feedback and when it comes to miniature painting, I'd always advocate to, to be honest with yourself about where you're at and then look at look at someone else's painting that either you look up to or you may be in your painting circle, you've got someone that is, has got a natural flair or is a certain, it has got a certain ability with the brush. It's always important to look to the person factually that you think in your opinion, and it is all, all, all at the end of the day, it's art and it's an opinionated thing just because something's done a certain way doesn't mean it's not good. But all I would say is in your opinion, looking at someone else's painting, if you like the way that they paint and if you harmonize with thinking that that's a good paint job, that's the person to speak to or that's the person to take advice yeah. from. Like, Critical feedback from somebody else it, that maybe isn't what you agree with or isn't how you want to paint doesn't invalidate their opinion. Their opinion is their opinion. They're entitled to it and they're allowed it. But all I would say is that you you have the deciding factor on what you take on board. And I think that's one of the most important it's, things. It's yeah. very easy to very quickly decide based on like intent. So yeah. like when you're reading yeah. a comment, it's like, is there intent with this mm -hmm. to give me valuable criticism yeah. or to tear me down? Yeah. Yes. And that will immediately allow you to discredit it. <laughs> because 99% of the time, if it's just a comment that you haven't asked for on mm. social media, all that person is trying to do is make themselves feel better about themselves. Yeah, exactly. I have never in my life seen something that I thought was bad on social media and thought, 
I must tell them. Yeah. I must tell them about <laughs> I'm gonna, it. Yeah. I'm going to... What, what sort of person... Like, put yourself in there. This is how it's so easy to dissociate from, like, the mean comments is, like, mm -hmm. can you possibly imagine thinking to yourself, like, if you saw something like this, writing a comment like that and hitting send? Like, wh what is going on in that person's yeah. life? Like, you should feel sorry for them rather than sit I'm, there and say, yeah. oh, that I should feel bad. I'm going to I'm gonna quote one of my favorite gurus of morality um, for social media, which is Thumper from Bambi. Um, <laughs> if you have nothing nice to say, don't say it at all. I could not agree more. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie, I'm a really petty person sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've had, I've had friends send me screenshots of like comments they've got. And I've been like, right, I'm going to do something about this. And I will send that person a DM or usually I'll reply publicly to them and be like, oh, really? And then just take them down because I have zero time for people going out in the community and being mean unnecessarily or at all. I, I think I think one of the problems with, uh, it, it, I mean, I, back in the day when it was just White Dwarf and your local gaming club and you didn't really have this problem at all whatsoever, like... Um, well, so, most of these things, it's not like they're going to say it to your face. I know, it? exactly. It's not, yeah, exactly. It's not like if you was at the gaming club and your game was you know, game was going on, someone would come up to you, pick up one of your Space Marines, turn it upside down, look at a tiny belt that wasn't perfectly yeah, painted, I, and then start I, ripping I, into you for I just, I just think that, that I, I totally understand what you're saying. It gets yeah. frustrating. I, I know that wholeheartedly. I, I know I really understand that. However, because as anyone who hopefully knows me well enough knows that I'm a time-orientated person, the, the minute or two that I'm typing out a reply or doing something is a minute I'm never going to get back and it validates that person's comments. Yeah. So for me, it's like, right, okay, I'll either ignore it, I'll block them or I'll just get rid of them out of my life never to think about it ever again. It solves the problem and in that way, I haven't got to deal with any issues like that ever again. Yeah. It's just not worth, like, it's not worth your time. Like, it really, really isn't. I understand totally what you're saying. I, 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 I would love to, to be able to just go, actually, I don't think you're right. I don't go, or whatever the case may be. But really, am I going to gain anything from that? It kind yeah. of gives them the validation of... The... No one's immune anyway, like you yeah. said. Like no, sometimes it catches you in the wrong mood. Yeah. Oh, and you think, you yeah. know what? Like, I'm going to go after you. Yeah. I'll tell you what though, I've got to give a shout out here to uh, Liam Dempsey. Yep. Liam is firstly a wonderful human being. I love him to pieces. We've had him on the podcast. We've had him on the podcast. Oh, I know, he's yeah. a legend. And he's, you he's, went on his. Yeah, he's a legend. Yeah. He's such a great guy. But he probably gave me one of the best pieces of advice when it comes to this kind of stuff because he gets it a lot. He said, look, don't reply for 24 hours. And if you still care in 24 hours, then, then reply. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And great I was advice. like, yeah, that's actually really good advice. Yeah. Like we, me and James do a series on the channel called Critique Clinic, which yeah. is where our patrons submit photos of their models and they're asking us for feedback. Yeah. But when we do that, we always say, because at the end of the day, it's art. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, people are painted for a myriad of reasons as yeah. well. So it's unfair to scrutinize something to a golden demon competition level yeah. if they're painted for a game with their friends. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So we always try to caveat anything we say with like, okay, well, this is like a factual thing. You haven't yeah. drilled the gun barrel. I would prefer to see the gun barrel drilled. Yeah. Things like that. And then also opinions. Yeah. So like I would say, I would personally have gone for this color choice or would have painted it in this way. That's my opinion. Take it for what it is. And it's yeah. up to them whether they want to take that or not. But that's someone who's asked for feedback. Yeah. Whereas if you're getting a comment online and you haven't asked for feedback. It's like, well, very different thing. Very different thing. I mean, this is exactly what I think about all the time when I'm planning my own personal painting projects, the context of the thing. The purpose of it. The purpose, exactly. Yeah. So for me, my context and my purpose when I'm planning a project is I'm a bit of a show off. I want this to look good. I want people to be like, wow, that looks really good. And also I'm doing that deliberate practice of a thing. So, you know, perfect example, my custodians, my edge highlighting army, my imperial fists were my first experiment with contrast paint. Mm -hmm. I contrast painted a whole army. Then my Empress children are my airbrush army. Mm -hmm. And so it's me learning a skill every time. Yeah. And on top of that, my, um, I went back through my imperial fists, redid all the blades, and I learned how to glaze. Mm -hmm. And it's that deliberate practice of there were 14 different swords and blades in the army. So I got to practice glazing on 14 different swords. Yeah. I, di I decided, oh, I'm going to practice NMM, uh, non-metallic metal, on all of the weapons in my Empress Children. And by doing that, it was that deliberate practice every time. I was working on a different skill every time. And so it's getting those 10,000 hours in a way that I wanted to. Yeah. That's it's really cool, actually, because we've, me and Joe in particular, spoke about on the previous episode of the podcast saying the like the deliberate practice thing. Because a lot of people say like, oh, how am I going to get better? And they're expecting to be like a subconscious thing. It's like, well, you need to pick something you can't do 
yeah. and practice it. But what I really like about what you've said, which is a bit different to what we said, is I've always thought of it in the context of like um, on a single model. Mm. But the fact that you're doing it across an entire army is like the reps yeah. is putting those hours in. So like, okay, because I would imagine that you know, say you haven't used an airbrush before and you go, I'm going to airbrush an entire army. Yep. The first one you do isn't going to look as good as the last one, but by the time the, all, all the army's done, you've learned a whole new skill yeah. competently. Yeah. Whereas if you yeah. just painted that one model, you might go, okay, well, I didn't know how to airbrush at the start and now I know a little bit. Precisely. And this actually goes back to kind of, my kind of day job is essentially operations. And so everything that I do has always been about, okay, how do I replicate this? Yeah. How do I do this again? And it's gotten to the point where like, I actually kind of struggle uh, if I'm doing a single miniature because I'm like, I've never done this before. I'm probably never going to do it in this way on anything else. What am I doing here? Like the sort of more laissez-faire artistic kind of style. Mm -hmm. Because if I was doing, you know, my Empress Children, for example, I did my test model, which I think is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. um, and through that, I refined my process. I then wrote my process down step by step mm -hmm. so that I could refollow it um, at any point in the future. And this is something you've talked about before, writing down what you're doing. Yeah. Because our memories suck. Yeah. It doesn't matter how good you think your memory is. Like you will forget. <laughs> the amount of times I've thought, I'll remember that. Don't worry. No, that, those browns won't. in that order, that's so uncommon. <laughs> I'll totally remember that. And then three okay. weeks later, you go sit down to paint and you're like, ah. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, damn it, last. But yeah, so that's the thing. Like I'm constantly thinking at the beginning of a project, how do I repeat this? How is this done several times? Like, for example, the NMM I'm doing, it's the same process, just done a bunch of different times on a bunch of different weapons. So I'm constantly thinking like, okay, how does this, how can I do the same NMM on a siege claw as I can a power claw? Yeah. They are very different things. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, it's again, that very deliberate practice going on and on. So what are, what are some things that you've learned then? Because you've painted quite a few armies and typically for gaming purposes, if I'm understanding yeah, that right. Yeah, basically all gaming. So if you was to start a new project now from scratch, mm. what are the things that you've learned from painting all of those armies that you would apply to say, get it done, you know, good standard, efficient amount of time. Say you're not necessarily looking to practice a specific technique, but what are some things you've learned from the previous armies that you would apply to your next one? I think when you plan any project, especially if you're, <laughs> a bit of a show off. <laughs> the thing that's the trick of it is knowing what corners to cut. Mm -hmm. So for example, my older Imperial Fists, the corners I cut with them, because yellow is a very visually impactful color. Mm -hmm. It kind of doesn't matter how good the model is, as long as it's like fairly clean and bright yellow, people are like, oh my God, that looks amazing. Mm -hmm. With the Imperial Fists, it was always, okay, what can I paint and get away with? Mm -hmm. So, for example, it's um, the, the painting um, sort of steps are undercoat with wraith bone, ironed in yellow over the whole thing, kind of just slapped on. And then over the flat panels, three layers of flash gets yellow. And then an edge highlight of Screaming Skull. The reason it's done like that in that order is because that creates a very big visual impact for the smallest amount of time with the color yellow. Yeah, Yellow has been that bright, color but basically by painting only the flat panels so top of the backpack head bit of the chest shoulders knees toes, toes <laughs> uh, and shins those are the only bits of the model your eye is drawn to in the first place mm. so those are the only bits i bothered edge highlighting and painting with those flat colors mm. and everyone who's like seen that army on a battle report or even in real life has gone wow they're really well painted and i'm like no, turn the model around. <laughs> it's actually kind of not. We were saying this on an episode, like you actually paint the models for the opposing player. You don't paint them for yourself. Kind of, yeah. yeah. So okay. one of our commenters said uh, they spend a lot of time on the backs of their models because that's all they'll ever see. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's so true. And so it's kind of knowing where the eye is drawn on a model yeah. and then just catering like you you're catering to the to the male gaze in this in this case yeah, that, that's exactly it. it's like, like uh yeah. you're it's, you're like a magician you're creating like an illusion you're yeah. like misdirection you know exactly what I mean? yeah <laughs> that's the trick of tabletop standard gaming i think understanding where the eye is drawn and catering to that i mean it's it's the old adage faces and bases yeah yeah got, if you've got good pace bases you basically have a fairly clean model and you paint the face really well people will be like that's really well painted mm. and that's the trick of it but when you said like, oh, 
you know, discounting painting techniques. I would never discount painting techniques. I think that's the fundamental core of how I paint models. So you wouldn't you wouldn't paint without the intent of learning necessarily then? Honestly, no. So like, for example, my projects, I've got two projects upcoming. One is Bretonians for Old World. And the thing I'm going to perfect on the Bretonians is freehand. Mm-hmm. I'm going to freehand as many shields and banners as I can. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll send you a picture of the one I've just done. It's like a quilted banner with a freehand NMM chalice on it. Wow, okay. Um, that's going to be across the whole army. Mm-hmm. And that's how I want to practice that. And then the next project after that, or well, probably concurrently, is going to be Night Lords, a Night Lords kill team. And that's how I'm going to practice dry brushing. Because it's a fantastic technique, I just don't use enough. I've never heard anyone speak about planning projects in this way. No, it's fascinating. Me neither, it's me so neither. cool because yeah. every single uh, like army you've got is like a perfect example. And you're going yeah. into it. It's cool as well that you're going into it going, I want to learn this technique. This is the army I'm choosing for it. Yeah. Oftentimes people might speak about like, you know, maybe they're halfway through an army and then they picked up like a new technique along the way, which is really cool. Yeah. But the fact that you're going into it, it's like you're thinking about the skill you want to learn first. Yeah. And then... It doesn't even seem like you're necessarily picking the army based around what would make that easier. No. It's no. just kind of an arbitrary choice. Because so like I wouldn't have thought personally of like Night Lords being the go-to for dry brushing. You might think of something else for that. Yeah. But you've gone, well, I want to learn dry brushing and I want to paint some Night Lords. So just Well, actually, so it's kind of a bit different. So when I looked at the Night Lords, I was just like, okay, obviously they've got to be dark blue. I can make that visually interesting by layering up from purple. Hmm. And I was like, ah, I've, I've seen a good, and I need to come back to this a little bit. I've seen a good way of doing that is dry brushing because it's like multiple thin layers on top of each other. Hmm. And this is where I actually forgot a step in this whole process. Um, this might be a bit crass. I apologize to our, to our viewers. I obviously have a bowel condition. I spend a lot of time in the loo. <laughs> so I watch a lot of YouTube and I read a lot of books this way. <laughs> If you ever see me disappear for half an hour, I'm in the loo. And so I watched 400 hours of YouTube painting tutorials. I've watched every Duncan tutorial on the Warhammer channel. I've watched basically every tutorial from Zumikito, from uh, Miniac, you know, from all of these guys. And that's how I know what is available to use as a technique. And I've gone, I need to practice that one. I would like to use this. And it's from that basis I've gone, okay, this is going to be the dry brushing army because I've seen that technique before used in these different ways. And I would like to express that on something. Yeah. So it's having that background in, I know what's available to use as a technique. And then this is how I'm going to execute that. Yeah. That's a really cool way of consuming content actually, because I'm quite similar. It's like- On the loop. It's almost, <laughs> well, <laughs> that as well. But you heard it here first. <laughs> where everyone is watching this podcast. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's like research more so than it is like, here's the thing I need to learn. I'm going to look up the solution. It's like, I'll watch a painting tutorial for something I never have any intent of really necessarily doing in the moment. But six months from now, I might be like, I might be in that scenario and be like, oh, I remember that tutorial. Let's find it back up, dig it up from the archives. I've saved it, whatever. Um, the only slippery slope though, oh, yeah? is I've spoken about how people can sometimes procrastinate and kick the can down the road of going, oh, I don't really feel like painting right now. I'm not feeling very, very motivated. But I'll watch some tutorials. Ah. That's basically the same thing. And I think a lot of people watch tutorials without the... It's good if you can get that end result and you're just treating it like research. But I think a lot of people watch them to kind of get away from doing the actual thing and feel like they're doing the thing. Yeah. The only way to do the thing is to do the thing. Yeah, I agree. I couldn't agree more, which is why I think I'm kind of in a bit more of a unique position than a lot of people because... I've had people ask me before, how do you maintain your, um, not passion, a motivation Mm -hmm. to paint more? I've never had a problem with that, Mm -hmm. ever. I think gaming actually comes into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. If ever I think you haven't a time where you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to paint this, I'm feeling a bit lackadaisical about it, play a game. Everyone who comes on the podcast says this to us. Yeah, Yeah, everyone who comes on, they say, plan, like, especially when there's a deadline involved. Yeah, yeah. If you're like, they're like, sign up for a tournament. Deadline, you've got to get an army finished. There's an excuse, there's a reason to do it. I, you know? I have literally done this multiple times. And again, Tris, who you know, uh, you know, one of my good, really good friends, like we've done more Battle Brothers at, at Warhammer head office than you could possibly shake a stick at. And and the and the thing is, is like every time we've done that, I got more done factually because That's I was it. like, I have to have it done. Or equally when we have, um, when there's like a GW release coming out, like we get um, sent stuff. Yeah. 
like the 10th edition, for example, <laughs> we painted that so insanely quick. <laughs> and I promise you it wouldn't have happened otherwise. Rapid, yeah. 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 I mean, with me, I hate deadlines. Mm -hmm. With me, it's more like, I need this unit to do this thing. Or like, I want a bit more, bit more showy with the next thing I paint. Like, <laughs> it's, it's all arrogance and ego, I think, with me. But also, yeah, painting to death. Like, the first Heresy No Retreat I went to, I put my application in with a Spartan assault tank and five tactical marines painted. And I had to paint a 3,000-point army in eight months. And I just didn't quite make it. <laughs> Which is why Pardo was very annoyed with me. Because I had a, <laughs> I had, I had a, a Kratos there. Um, and I bought it and I was just like, oh, it's got airbrush highlights and then a couple of highlights on top and some base colors. It'll be fine. It was not fine. He yeah. was so upset. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because that, that, again, at the SN, with those the retreat events, they're all about the presentation. The armies all need to yeah. be there. Yeah. And I get that totally. Yeah. One, one thing I just wanted to circle back on really quickly because I because it's really, and I'll say this the same way that George is, it's so interesting and also refreshing to see a different way that somebody paints projects as in like focusing on a technique. Mm -hmm. I think, the, the way that I think all, all of us are quite similar in, the, in is that we have an intent behind the way that we use the brush. And I think that's the, that's the thing. Like for me, I have always, since I was a kid, because it's the way my, my granddad taught me how to do airfix because I was doing scale models. It's got to be perfect. It's got to look real. It's got to look how, the, 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 how they would actually be. And I think because ever since I had that, when it came to 40K, it was like, well, that's how it is in the artwork. That's how it is in the codex. Yeah. That's how I've got to paint it. Do you know what I mean? So- um, f the same way you pick a technique and do that on a specific project, which is super interesting. And again, I've not heard anyone do painting in that way. For me, it's like when every time I'm using the brush, I want it to be the best I can do. You're basically pushing yourself on that specific technique. But I would argue probably that when you're painting those projects and you're focusing on doing that technique, do you still have intent of doing it the best you can with everything else that's on the model, irrelevant of learning on it? Yeah, absolutely. And there's actually a step I've missed out from all of this as well. I'm known, I think, as a narrative guy as much as a painting guy. Mm -hmm. Like, we talked about Black Library earlier. Yeah. I've read over 180 of the Black Library novels. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of books. It's a lot of books. It's a lot of time on the loo. You, you're, <laughs> you're in competition with Ron Burgundy, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I have many leather bound books. <laughs> <laughs> I unfortunately don't play jazz flute, though. <laughs> <laughs> Whips out jazz guitar. <laughs> but yeah, this is the thing, like... Whenever I'm planning an army, the narrative is also very center yeah. for me. And that adds to the painting of it. Yeah, of course it does. I agree with you. Perfect yeah. example 100%. of this is my Empress. No, yeah, actually my Empress Children. So when I was picking my Empress Children, I was like, okay, this is going to be my airbrush army. But more than that, how am I going to do the markings? What are the helmet colors going to be? How is that going to be done? How is that going to be designed? You've got like secondary objectives sort of within. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Secondary objectives. And so even within what I'm doing for the painting, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, the Empress Children and actually all of the, the legions have what are called the inductii. The inductii are the like rapidly intro introduced uh, marines that happened at the end of the heresy. Like we need more marines, just get them in armor and get them on the front line. And they all have slightly different variations on the helmets and the color scheme and the, the whatever. And so I was just like, okay, cool. I want some inductii. The inductii in the Empress Children, they didn't really come in squads by themselves. They were just kind of like replacements and just put into squads. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, I need, because I've got loyalist Empress Children, I need to introduce them into the squads randomly in a way that um, fits their narrative. So... I also use that as a way of doing a minor practice of freehand because they're a black helmet with a purple stripe. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to need to freehand that purple stripe. I've never done anything like that before. Mm -hmm. And I can practice glazing on this as well because um, I want there to be a gradient from like a lilac to a deep purple. Yeah, yeah. So I did that on like 20 helmets. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I introduced them randomly to the different squads. It adds character. I love that. And also it's a thing I'm practicing. Yeah. And like, if we look into the narrative a little bit more, I think I take it a little bit further than most people. I don't know if you guys know anything about my Empress children, but when I first planned the project, I was like, okay, I'm going to go full narrative on this. <laughs> so I was like, okay, they're going to be loyalists, Empress children. Um, so I had to design a narrative based around why they were loyalists. 
So I got a buddy of mine who's doing Horus Heresy as well, and he's got Sons of Horus. So we actually have a shared narrative between both of our armies. Uh, mine was, oh, okay, we're going to go. This is a ramble strap in for this. So the Emperor's Children, the way they operated was the Legion, for the most part, stayed in very big formations. The reason for that is because when Fulgrim first came back to the Legion, discipline was extremely poor. Mm -hmm. So he instituted a very rigid system of an officer class and very rigid, distinct rules and regulations. And that was helped by the fact the Legion stayed together fairly as a whole. Mm -hmm. So the reason why my guys are loyalist is because the commander at the time of that particular detachment of Emperor's Children impressed um, Fulgrim during an earlier campaign. That campaign happens in the Rogal Dawn Primarch novel. Mm -hmm. um, I'll remember it later. And so he was actually sent off by himself because Fulgrim trusted him. However, he was a very good commander, but he didn't play the game of politics in the Emperor's Children very well. So even though he was so good, the reason why the other reason why he was sent off was because his fellow commanders put him in a position where he was able to impress Fulgrim. He was sent off by himself and he was no longer a problem for them mm. because he had his ambitions immediately thwarted because he's away from the Legion. Yeah, yeah, of course. Which also meant that because he didn't play the game of politics very well, he was never inducted into any of the warrior lodges. So he didn't take them with him when he was sent off away. Yeah. And so they didn't fall. That's the level of depth that, the, like, for me, that's like the level of depth that I absolutely love. In in in, that's one of the things for me that that irrelevant of how good models is sculpted or cast or whatever the case may be. That for me is the the the, the if you want that's the reason for the addiction to the plastic crack. That it, it's it's that it's literally the level of thought and depth that you can put onto, and that's before we even talk about painting. Well, this, this goes oh. back to earlier when we said how all-encompassing this hobby is and yeah. everybody sleeps yeah. and breathes it. I mean, I haven't even told you about the Trello board yet. I'm saying that. <laughs> You've like, got a Trello board for your army. That's, that's top-tier oh. top stuff. But it's, so, it's, <laughs> I haven't even explained layer two of the narrative. Yeah. So, again, strap this in is, this, this. is a real onion, this army. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, layer two of the narrative for this was my lucky number is six. So, I was like, okay... I want to, because the Emperor's Children, they don't have chapters. They call each sort of chapter a millennial. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, okay, I want the sixth millennial, but probably the first battalion of the sixth millennial. Now, the way that the structure of the legions worked was, you know how you've got like the third company, fourth company? The number of companies is sequential from first to 1,080th. Mm -hmm. So... I had to figure out which companies were in the first battalion of the sixth millennial, which means I had to work out the entire structure of the Emperor's Children from Heresy. <laughs> so I went to the first black book, uh, which is the first heresy book from the first edition of Heresy, and I figured out the pre-Heresy number of Emperor's Children was 110,000 Marines. So if you subdivide that by the number of millennials, which I believe is 30, you come out with 3,666 Marines per Millennial, millennial yeah. which then goes down into number of battalions and then number of companies. So I figured out that the companies that would be in the first battalion of the sixth millennial would be the 216th to the 220th companies. Right. So I created a Trello board <laughs> for each different company, which includes each squad. Each squad has a named sergeant with backstory, a home world, and hobbies. Because, hobbies? Yeah. <laughs> Because long the, walks on the beach. Oh, no, no. <laughs> it's all artistic pursuits and sports because the Emperor's children, one of their big things was uh, Fulgrim encouraged them to take up artistic pursuits. And so each one of them has like, okay, this one sings in the company choir. This one, <laughs> <laughs> this one's part of, <laughs> legit, like this one's part of a string quartet. Like there are intercompany choral competitions in my battalion. Like, like this is a thing. Like, game when, together when, for like the softball game yeah. on the weekend, like this company versus this. Yeah, I like it's it. It's like a yeah. thing. I'd and love like, to see this spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> or I'll, I'll show you in a minute. And like, yeah, each one has uh, a name and like a backstory. Like, okay, perfect example. This one involves the Blood Angels. Mm -hmm. So my uh, my captain for my two hundred and seventeenth company, his backstory was: you know how you have the um, the inter legion sort of like exchange program. Mm -hmm. So he was sent to the Blood Angels. Now, the thing about the Emperor's Children is that their psyche and their nature is that they are deeply insecure. Mm 
Mm -hmm. The reason they're insecure is because, you know, when Fulgrim found them, they were basically not a legion. There's 200 of them left. And so they had to rebuild from nothing. So they have this deep insecurity of like, oh God, were we flawed? Mm -hmm. Because they had this gene blight, et cetera. And they're constantly trying to prove something. So this guy turns up at the Blood Angels and he's like, okay, these guys think they're good at art. I'm going to show them what art's really about. <laughs> <laughs> and so he turns up and he is just an insufferable person. And they all hate him. Every single Blood Angel he comes into contact with, they're all like, who is this guy? For God's sake, can't he just shut up? And so eventually what happens is he annoys them so much about how good he is at art is they beat him up. And in the, the is it the Red Tear or the Red Tear? I never know. The Red, uh, what the, the Battle Barge, the yeah. uh, Gloriana class. Um, yeah. It is the Red, oh, I'm going to, I should know this off the top of my head. You red should tier. know this. Red Tear. The Red Tear, yeah. okay. In the bowels of the Red Tear is just a whole big hall full of the most impressive art you've ever seen in your life. And the Blood Angels just make it for the artistic pursuit of making it. They, it's not showy for them. And so what they do is they beat this guy up and lock him in there just to be like, look, you're not as good as, our, as us, shut up. And so this is the most humbling experience of this guy's life. He's never experienced anything like this. And he's looking around like, oh my God, I can't believe this has happened. Totally humble, doesn't know what to do. He has to go to the, the Blood Angel chaplains. He's like, I don't know what to do here. I'm supposed to be representing my legion. And I thought I was, but I've just been like shown that I'm not as good at this as everyone else. And they basically have to tell him, like, look, you're here to learn. Yeah. You're not here to be a braggart. And he takes this on board. And that's the thing that enables him to become a good commander in the end. That's why he becomes a captain, because he was sent to the Blood Angels as a battle brother. He has this humbleness inside, like, okay, no, I need to learn. And I learn from everyone around me. And he's still a bit arrogant, but he takes that into command. And that's one of the reasons he remains loyal. And, and everything you just described and the level and the passion behind it is the thing that makes this hobby the best in the world, <laughs> <laughs> factually. That's not my opinion. Uh, it, 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 I, I always, I'm so glad that you love law as much as you do because like we always talk about in on, on sort of different shows we have when we have different individuals on or whether we do our own, our own it's just us three, like... I, I'm very much about the law and I'm very much about using it as as a, almost like a part of a triad of things when it comes to painting. It should be about the quality, should be about the, the, the different parts of it. And it should also have, should have obviously a law aspect to it because it's, otherwise the models are soulless without it, in my opinion. You know, they don't have, they don't have, a space marine wouldn't be a space marine if it didn't have all the things behind it that make it a space marine. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, um, so yeah, but no, that's that's mega. Like yeah, that's absolutely <laughs> mega. Um, the depth that you go into on that. That's I haven't got a Trello board, but um, but uh, yet, yet. <laughs> we frequently hear from you with questions asking how you can paint like our team of world class and award winning artists. Teaching is something that all of the team here at Siege are very passionate about, and we want to share with you the methods and techniques that we use to paint every single day all of the incredible miniatures and armies that you have seen from us. With the Seed Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a growing catalogue of over 300 step-by-step -step tutorials covering a huge variety of colour schemes, miniatures, painting styles and techniques, from beginner-focused foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses. Each lesson comes in a beautifully designed and easy-to-follow PDF format with accompanying artist commentary with new tutorials added every single week. Your subscription also includes access to our private patron channels on Discord so that you can interact directly with our artists asking for questions or feedback. You'll also be supporting the podcast directly, helping us to bring you these episodes every single week. So if you want to take your painting to the next level and make the most of your very valuable hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash siege studios. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on a future episode of the podcast, then please do leave it in the comments down below. Uh, this week we have a question from Alex who says, hypothetical topic suggestion, your house burned down, all your minis and tools are lost. What's on your shopping list for your brand new workstation? For the workstation, no models. So I've just lost yeah, well, all my models. I've lost all my retro well, paint. I've lost everything. Yeah, and right. start, start from square one. So, let, And let's assume, of course, that you've got your Onyx painting lamp. Okay. That's first on the list. That's okay. so obvious. We're not even going to mention that okay. one. <laughs> you know what it's going to be. It's the most on-brand biased thing ever. A second Onyx painting lamp. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rebuying a pot of blood red. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> it's the first thing I'm That's getting. such a cop-out answer. I, I, 
It's the obvious one. No, okay. All right. I'm not allowed to choose a thing that I would get, but yeah, fine. Um, I would probably say uh, a good hobby desk, a decent workspace. That's the thing. I think like, I like a decent space to work in. So I'd buy, I'd replace the desk that I have now. That's, that's what I'd buy. And then the blood red. Okay. I've got such a specific answer for this. Go for it. Okay. So this is like dream setup territory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So everything's burnt down. I've lost everything. The first thing is, yeah, you're right, a desk, but I'd go more specific than that. You need a desk that is a standing desk for one. I've always envied can, those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. You can raise and lower it. Specifically, the reason for that is because if you were painting like hunched down, like here, um, podcast listeners, if you're hunched over the desk, it can be bad for your back. Yeah. It can mean you get strain, etc. So if you raise the desk, you're kind of painting a bit more in front of your face. Yeah, yeah. And then you can lower it when you're working on your laptop. Yeah. So there's that for one. Also, a standing desk that has edges um, that you can clamp stuff to around the whole circumference of it. Because my current desk at home doesn't have that, which means I can't have that onyx lamp because I have nothing to attach it to. And oh, it's right. so annoying. Yeah, because well, like there's sort of a flat edge to the desk. So you exactly. Can't, like, yeah, yeah. That yeah. Makes sense, yeah. So a desk that allows that. And I'd actually have two Onyx lamps from either Inside, angle. Inside, yeah, yeah. Because I find top down, you still get those top down shadows. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, two different angles. On top of that, I would... This is something I think a lot of people overlook. I think a lot of people put their brushes just in a cup. Mm-hmm. I, with good brushes especially, I never do that. Instead, I've got a stand, which is kind of like a samurai sword rack. Um, where I put them in laterally. Yeah. And the reason for that, as you know, is so the moisture drains out of it rather than going down into the feral. Yeah. 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 Which will cause matting, which will mean your brushes don't last as long. So that stand as well. And then on top of that, a really big cutting mat. Yeah. Yeah, I love those. I didn't realize we've got loads of options. I I picked picked one (laughs) of those obvious and then I said a desk. I mean, I'm going hobby zone. I'm going like, I'm going hair dryer. I'm going like new air Oh, hair dryer's a good one. I'm going like- Do you know what mine is actually? It actually circles into the sort of the ergonomics thing. The biggest upgrade I ever made to my setup was uh, getting one of the Secret Labs chairs. Yeah. Or just any sort of like well-made, nice, comfortable, adjustable office chair with like nice big armrests. Cause like I haven't got a standing desk. I haven't got room for it. But the fact that I can- like have really, really adjustable armrests that I can like rest my elbows on when I'm painting so I can get my arms up high. Yeah. Really, really nice. And also if you're someone who paints for a long, long time, I didn't realize what a massive quality jump like a nice office chair can have. Yeah. And like, unfortunately they're very, very expensive, but it's one of those things that like you, uh, was it buy it nice or buy it twice? Yeah. Oh, the so amount true. of office chairs that I've gotten through in my life, it's like you could have just bought the nice yeah. one. Yeah. 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 Honestly, same thing with brushes. Like buy 100%. nice or buy twice. Like, 100%. Yeah. I think you should have I should have put some hobby hacks. Um, <laughs> I think you should have a set of brushes you use for base coats mm-hmm. and a set of brushes you use for everything else. Yeah. Because the base coat brushes, you're going to hack. Yeah. And I think genuinely, the Games Workshop natural hair brushes are really good for that. For base coating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. Yeah, good. Cool. Well, you said it already. Hobby hacks <laughs> is our weekly tradition on the podcast where we share a little quick tip with, uh, with our listeners. Something that you can hopefully incorporate into your painting like right away. Just a little quick tip. As is tradition, we do this with the guests. Quipster, your hobby hack. Oh, I was thinking about this so much on the way here. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one actually would have been the two brushes thing, two sets of brushes. Yeah. The other one, and I've introduced it a little bit, is definitely Trello. Okay. So it might seem like overkill to use project management software to, <laughs> to manage your Warhammer life, but I've found it to be absolutely essential. Can you give just like an overview of what it is? So the way Trello works is that you've got a board and the board has different columns and each column you have a number of cards. So what I like to do, and you can move the cards between columns and what you can do is you can set up um, a couple of different systems with it. So you can do what's called a Kanban style system, which is you've got three columns. First column is to do, next one is in progress, next one is done. And you move the cards between each column. That's actually how I manage painting projects. Mm. I have my to-do, well, actually, it's like uh, unbuilt, built and undercoated, in-progress painting and done. And then I separate the columns in done into how much I've done per year so I can track how many models I've painted year on year and get an average. I, I've got more sh- more grey shame than the Games Workshop stock factory. So like my, <laughs> the, column, the column on to-do is going to be like, you're going to keep scrolling. It's going to be like quite a lot. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Saying this, I actually have a, a minor hobby hack to do with that. A hobby uh, hack within a hobby, hobby hack. We love, this, a, we love an inner hobby hack. This so, is yeah. the inception. We're going to the second level. So 
I think it's very easy for us to get stressed out yeah. and anxious about what we call the pile of shame. Mm-hmm. I've taken a bit of a, a note out of the Gundam community. They don't call it the pile of shame. They call it the stack. stack. And I like that a lot more because it doesn't have the negative connotation. It's the you know, pile of potential. Yeah, kind we, of yeah we, we spoke about this actually uh, a few episodes ago, only, yeah. only recently. It was because um, I found the scale model community, call it the stash. Yeah. yeah. So it's like the the sort of repertoire of like bits and parts and stuff. It's like yeah. a collection rather than is a, you know, missed opportunity, I guess. hundred percent. And I love that idea of, someone explained this analogy to me a while ago. I was like, oh my God, that's genius. Because I, I've felt anxious about, you know, my stack before. You think, oh God, I really want to get all to this, but you know, it's, I've got lots of other stuff going on. The way I think it's really useful to look at this stuff is like an expensive wine rack. Imagine you're having dinner with some friends one night and you're like, oh, I'm just going to go down to the cellar and just like take this expensive bottle of wine and share it with friends. I like that, mentali- that mentality because no one has a wine cellar and they go, oh, I've got so much wine to drink. Yeah, oh, yeah. this is going to take me so long. You don't get anxious about it yeah. in the same yeah. way. It's a collection and everything has got a perfect opportunity on the horizon and it's time will come. Exactly. I, I synergize with that, but with all my retro old paint. Oh, for God's <laughs> sake. I, I, I love being able to go oh that bit that, that pot of un- of sealed rotting flesh or like I, 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 when, when, you that. when you mentioned wine collection like my paint collection that's what I see it as I, I like collecting it those. is it would make a very rich person's wine collection look pathetic <laughs> the amount the, just let's let's stop there the amount of blood red that James <laughs> has would make someone's modest wine collection look pathetic let alone expanding it to the broader range of paint itself it's, it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty <laughs> most bad. most would it describe is. it as a problem and I would actually say it warrants intervention. I'm going to call it an opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's well, exactly what it is. At what point does opportunity become obsession? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, hundred percent. I would, I would like to change the mentality that way from the pile of shame to the stack and like this pile of potential. Cause yeah, otherwise I think it's easy to get anxious about it. hundred so percent. That's, that's yeah, yeah. the inception like hack within a hack. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Good. But yeah. Amazing. Going, going back to the Trello board, um, I track my projects like that. Um, and I find that really useful because it means like, ah, oh, okay. I on average paint between 50 to 70 miniatures a year. I can plan my kind of year based on that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, which is quite nice. And so the other way I use Trello is by planning out how I paint each model. Yeah. Because everything I do, I'm thinking about constantly, how do I replicate this? Yeah, yeah. And actually kind of more than that, one thing I, and you know, you're a teacher, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. I love sharing mm. what I do. I, I, even if I made content full time, there's very little of like my painting techniques to the, whatever I would put behind a paywall. Um, not a critique of you guys. I love your stuff. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> It's just because I, I like sharing this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of part of how I enjoy the hobby. Yeah. So people ask me all the time, how did you paint this? How do you paint your purple? How do you paint your yellow? I have a link set up to a Trello board that has the full guide on everything I've ever painted. Oh, that's really cool. That's really yeah. good, yeah. And it's done sequentially. That's the nice thing about it being digitized as well, I suppose, is that it can be shareable in that way. Yeah. Exactly. And so it's subdivided into the point where I've got at the top, this is what the finished model looks like. Um, underneath that, here are the sub-assemblies I painted it in. This is how to do those sub-assemblies. Underneath that, it's which base code, I, which undercoat color I use, and then a sequential guide of which paint I used in the order I used them and on which bits of the model. Because sometimes you'll do the black stage and then you have to go a bit later, a different black stage with different parts of the model. Yeah, of course, yeah. So yeah, it's all sequentially done and that's for everyone else and for me. Yeah, that's really so, cool. Makes yeah, it's, it's some, setting up something like that like quite a big time sink. It doesn't really matter, honestly, because it's so worth it in the long run. It, on, it, honestly, well, you can do it as you go though, can't you? You can do it as you go. I guess, I guess is it one of those things that's like uh, maybe a lot more time initially to set up, but then it's easy to add to? Honestly, I think it takes about 20 minutes to half an hour if I was to plan out properly um, like a whole stack of this is how I paint this model. Oh, that's not too bad. So it's actually idea. not that no, bad. No, 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 no. Yeah. yeah that's, that's worth it. It's, it's almost the same as I can say about using a journal just to plan the project. It's exactly. Like, cup of tea, half hour, job done. So yeah, 100%. yeah makes and sense. And that's like a sort of activity in itself, isn't it? Because the nice thing yeah. about that is if it's if you're, you know, say on a train or on a plane or traveling yes. or something, you can be doing the hobby away from your hobby. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And I've literally done that. 
yeah. <laughs> on flights just on the iPad and Trello just like, okay, I use Mourn Van Brown and then I use this wash. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I think that's been so critical for my journey going forward. And I even do that with like the single miniature stuff I do. Mm -hmm. um, like I, for Golden Demon, I painted a, uh, what's it called? Dark Strider model? Yeah, amazing model. Oh, so good. So I did a step-by-step -step of this is how I painted this. I'm probably never going to paint a Dark Strider again, but that's going to be valuable to me and whoever I send that to. Yeah, 100%. Of course, yeah. So but, yeah, I think that's sense. that's my, my hobby hack. Amazing. Uh, massive thank you for your hobby hack, of course. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, where can all of the lovely listeners find all of your amazing content? Um, I'm mainly most active on Instagram. You can find me if you search Quipster Nerd. Uh, and I'm on YouTube as well. If you search Quipster Nerd, I'll come up. Okay, amazing. They will be in the links of this episode, of course, down in the description. We're going to jump over to the patron segment of the podcast now. A little bit of bonus content for you. So if you want to check that out, check the links down below. Otherwise, we will catch you next week. Right, so some Sangard came out. <laughs> yeah. Definitely not a controversial spicy, release. Spicy yeah. Sangard, yeah. Spicy. So what I think of the Sangard... Um, 